I'd like to move on to Maurice, my friend Maurice, uh, uh, whom uh, I had the pleasure to work with uh, in the few uh, past years together, and who has been French ambassador uh, in many different countries, huh? Japan and China, to start with the East, but also Germany uh, and, and the UK, and obviously also having worked as the Undersecretary General uh, in the French Foreign Ministry. And uh, we have always had uh, a lot of debates about, is the world now multipolar? Which one of these scenarios is coming? So I very much look forward to your introductory statement. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki, for uh, your presentation, which shows clearly that uh, geopolitics are back in our agenda, and that for the risk management, not only for the states, but uh, as well for the companies, uh, we have to take into account these evolutions and to set up what the framing is for our action. Uh, we are in a time of war, whether it will develop, it will unfold in tripolar, or whether there will be something frozen forever. Uh, the thing is for sure that this time of war with, with, will uh, last for a while. Uh, we shall go through the winter, and thereafter we shall see what will happen. Uh, Klosevitz, and it's not to show erudition, I say that, Klosevitz had an expression. He, he, he said that uh, uh, the culminating point of the battle has not yet been reached between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, and the culminating point means that there is a breakdown for moral reasons, for no equipments, uh, or for external factors. And there is still, regarding external factors, a fatigue of these nine and a half months of war. We see that in the public opinions across the world. We see that with the impact in the, this global world uh, regarding food security, pesticides and all that. Uh, and we see it also with the change of majority at the House of Representatives in Washington. So all these are factors which have to be, I would say, included, involved in the analysis we have. The uncertainty, uncertainty uh, already existed before the war. We had the COVID, and the COVID gave us the awareness that there were dependencies which, which were not uh, sustainable, and there were already decisions um, made of uh, repatriating, relocating some industries uh, in the vaccine sector, for instance. So this was, I would say, the preliminary. Now, as uh, Thierry was saying this morning, uh, the war was an accelerator, and what has happened shows that we shall never go back to the future. Uh, the, to, the, to the past. We shall never go back to the past. The future will be different. I read uh, recently an article which was quoting uh, Maurice Chung, who is the founder and chairman of TSMC, and he said, globalization is over. There will be no more globalization. So, how is the world looking like now? We talked this morning a lot about it already, but we said there are blocks. In a certain way, yes, there are blocks. There is one block for sure, which is the block of US, EU, and some other countries, in fact, OECD countries, which are the, the ones who support Ukraine and who are the applicants of the sanctions. This is a block. Then you have <laughs> China, Russia, a very odd couple now, with uh, China ambiguous, uh, supporting verbally uh, Russia in all the aspects of the, the, this war being against the uh, Western model, but being totally, I would say, on the retreat regarding any support would be technological or financial or military. So that's a position which is very, very interesting. Russia is like a besieged fortress, which it will remain for a long while because the sanctions after the war, until there are negotiations, uh, will last. And so Russia is of major interest for the world and for many countries because of commodities, rare earths, uh, energy, all kinds of, uh, I would say, products which uh, this huge country still uh, has uh, with it. Um, the point is that uh, uh, the whole world looks at China and Russia, and that's how the world is reshaping itself, trying in a way to bypass the sanctions, and regarding China, considering China as the platform of uh, uh, trade, uh, and the future for everyone. Because let's keep in mind that China still represents uh, about 20% of the trade, even if the figures are slowing down, and even if there are economic uh, zero-COVID uh, policy uh, consequences. Um, 
China represents also one third of the global growth of the world. So that's important. And how do behave the countries regard, regarding that? As a block in a way, but on very different manners. And I would like to come back with what Mr. Walalu said this morning, which is multi-alignment. If we look at the world, we see that uh, we, we look what is said, for instance, by uh, the F Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs, of External Affairs of India, uh, Subramaniam Jaishankar, who said, multi-alignment is the new behavior of countries, which means you behave according to your own interests. India is a champion in that sense. Uh, India, one day at the outreach of the G7, the other day at the BRICS, the third day at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the fourth day uh, having Vostok drills in the Pacific with Chinese and Russian in front of Japan, and the fifth day uh, being with the Quad with the Americans in the Indo-Pacific policy. That's what Mr. Jai Shankar says. There is now, there are no more fluid alliances. We must work accordingly to our interests. Turkey, Turkey, member of NATO, and now applying to be a member of the BRICS. So we have to take into account these new evolutions, which doesn't show that people will betray you, but uh, countries will betray you, but not th some more agility uh, in the world as it is. Now, we, we have uh, the, la the rest of the world are this swarm, I would call it like that, swarm of middle-sized countries or smaller countries which try to survive because inflation is there, uh, security, pesticide in Africa, about 35 countries depend on imports from Ukraine and Russia regarding the grain imports. Uh, pesticide means that if you don't get them from that region, about 35 countries out of 54, these are uh, international food organization's figures, uh, you will not have harvest next year. So what will that mean? And it explains the trip made by President Macky Sall of the African Union to Moscow uh, in June, and then President uh, Widodo of Indonesia, President of G20, going to Moscow and Kiev and coming back and saying, this war is not a, our war. We want to fight inflation and feed our people. Let's keep it in mind. This is the direction of the world and the most of the countries, about 120 to 140 countries in the world, are behaving according to this pattern. Now let's go a bit, let's have a look a bit further on how the things will evolve. We have this block, I said, uh, of the OECD countries, let's call them like that. Actually, look at EU-US relationship, more and more complicated, for obvious reasons which you know. Energy, this, uh, this issue was raised this morning, energy. Uh, the price of energy in the US will be now four times less than the price of energy in the EU. So there, is, there are already delocation of industries and investments instead of being done in, in, in the EU, done in the US. That has consequences regarding uh, the, the, the jobs, regarding uh, for employment, may, let's call it, and uh, regarding activity and social consequences and political consequences. Then you have this IRA, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act on green economy, hundreds of uh, uh, billion of, uh, of, uh, of dollars. Uh, it is the American interest, okay, but all these uh, possibilities, subsidies given to green economy will be, I would say, will counter efforts in the EU regarding electric vehicles and other, 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 other products. How will the EU react to that? I was listening to uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton, uh, who was talking uh, two days ago and saying that uh, if we go for a tariff, uh, for ha having tariffs on uh, imports of uh, American products, then it will be a commercial war. Is it the best way? We must not kill, I would say, the free trade. So why not have a buy European act? We shall have to react. So we shall have also, companies will have to adapt to, to these evolutions. Then between EU and US, defense issues. Defense issues now because of the war, NATO is more consistent, but 23 countries out of 27 EU member countries are now member countries of, uh, of, the, of, of NATO. So where is the, the, the self-reliance, the autonomy, the sovereignty, of uh, the EU regarding defense in the future. There is a consequence for that. Look at this uh, um, statement uh, which was uh, given after the summit 
held in Madrid uh, by NATO member countries, which says, as in the second paragraph, that China has become a challenge to the security of the Euro-Atlantic zone. That's something which is important. What will be the future? So we must have it in mind. Now, let's see very clearly that on all these settings, China is taking the lead, the lead of the BRICS, the lead of the SCO. While I was saying we are bypassing, trying, countries are trying to bypass sanctions, there are new channels to import oil, and we try, I say we, they try, to avoid sanctions. Secondary sanctions are a major issue which is not often raised, but which makes many countries be off the Western countries. And there are now uh, compensation funds, ruble, rupee, or Turkish pound, uh, ruble, uh, for uh, enabling uh, trade and, uh, for instance, tourists to go to Turkey regarding uh, the second fund. A new issue, and I think uh, Mr. Mazuri may, we may, maybe will comment, electronic currencies. Uh, electronic currencies, which is the way China is thinking of trying to avoid sanctions in case the confrontation with the US becomes tougher, in case there would be sanctions on companies working with China. So e-currencies enable countries with their central banks to avoid the swift uh, transaction, transborder uh, processes. And so this is something we have to follow very closely because the intention, as it is very often said, is that the crude oil from this region will be bought by China in EU yuan. So that's a point. So now we have three major zones of which are rising zones. Of course, Asia, with the competition. On one side, RCEP, led by uh, Regional Cooperation Economic um, um, Prosperity Zone, which is uh, led by China with 15 other countries, Asian countries, plus Japan, Australia. This is transition. On the other side, IPEF. It was mentioned today, uh, Indo-Pacific Economic uh, uh, framework, which would be more focused on supply chains, on green economy, which is led by the US. So this is a competition, but many, many, I would say, of the things of the future will happen in that region of Pacific, and there will be norms and standards coming out from those regions. Another rising zone, your zone, rising uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Look at investments done in this region, but also look, for instance, at Neom, this capital of Saudi Arabia, new capital, which is on the Red Sea, and trying to project and deploy on Africa, on Northern Africa, Egypt, Sudan, Eastern Africa. That's a key point for the dynamics of that region, where there will be, with organization and a firm political will, the possibility of having bright investments, and that's something we must keep in mind as well. Then Africa. Africa, I think uh, Sam will talk better than me on Africa, but let's look at this Africa, and uh, Jean-Michel Severino here can talk about it as well. Uh, there are, it's contrasted, but these are zones of growth on which we must have a very firm look. Now, just to finish, the, the, the challenges we have. First challenge, we must reorganize, it was said this morning, the world order, to re-legitimate the world order, uh, institutions, processes, because that doesn't work. It's completely paralyzed, and we have to, to organize this disorder, which will last for a while. Second, we must absolutely avoid bipolarization, because there are most of the countries, I was, the swarm of countries, the, all these multi multi-aligned countries don't want to choose either the US nor China. They want to continue their development and bipolarization would, I would say, impede uh, this development to be done in these rising zones I was mentioning. It would be also a major issue for the EU and so these are issues on which we can talk about uh, afterwards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maurice. So we are moving from in the, not only in a fragmented world but in a multi-aligned world. Uh, that's what I take away from that discussion and of course I think uh, we'll have a series of questions coming up here.